Vortrages vorstellen zu dürfen. Nach der deutschen Sichtweise beleuchtet nun Mark Dorsey aus den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika für uns dieses Thema. Mark Dorsey ist Executive Director und CEO der Professional Ski Instructors of USA und gleichzeitig ist er Executive Director der amerikanischen Snowboard Instructors Association. Ich freue mich auf den Vortrag von Mark Dorsey. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Eight years ago, during the Crown Montana Interski, Michael Berry, the president of the National Association of uh, Ski Areas, the National Ski Areas Association in the United States, presented a model for growth. That model encouraged resort operators and all of us to try to attract more beginners to snow sports. And just as important, to keep more of those beginners in as lifelong skiers and riders. <clears throat> I and my colleagues from the Professional Ski Instructors of America and the American Association of Snowboard Instructors are here to talk to you about <clears throat> what has happened during those past eight years. What we'll talk to you about is that we have seen growth, but that growth hasn't been as strong as we would hope for. That we have seen more of the same guests coming more often, and that those guests have more and different needs than at any point in our history. And while that sounds challenging, the Professional Ski Instructors of America and the American Association of Snowboard Instructors have managed to grow substantially during that period of time. What I hope you will be able to take from this are some lessons that we've learned. You can take those back to your home countries and your areas, and you may find inspiration or ideas that will help you grow snow sports wherever you are. As I said, today we're going to talk about the bigger picture of snow sports. Tomorrow during our lecture, our teams will talk about the learning partnership and how to make that connection with the individual guests so that they become excited about skiing and snowboarding and stay excited about skiing and snowboarding. And on Hill, we'll talk about teaching to different tools, whether it be freestyle, snowboard, adaptive, Nordic, alpine, from beginner through advanced, so once again, we keep that emotion strong in snow sports as we talked about yesterday. So with that in mind, <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about the state of the US industry. I'm going to focus primarily on alpine skiing and snowboarding because we have the best data for a long period of time. There isn't much information about cross country, though in the US there are suggestions that that has declined as much as two thirds. Recently, however, we've seen some increase in the number of sales of uh, equipment for cross country, but the best information we have is about skiing and snowboarding. And one note, of course, is that in 1991 at Interski, anybody that wasn't on alpine skis was, well, a specialty demonstrator. We want to take the entire picture of snow sports into account as we talk. This is the growth in the, over the last 15 years of participation, the number of, or the people that have come over, the time, over time to visit ski and snowboard areas in the United States over the last 15 years. Uh, we had a record high of 60 million visits in 2008. In 2010, the numbers, final numbers weren't in, it's about 60 mil, uh, is 59 million visits and we're on track for a very good th year this year. So at face value, it looks like a really good year and a very good trend. However, one of the things that we need to take a look at is where are these folks coming from? This is about 9% growth over 15 years. Not exactly rocket growth. Where do they come from? Well, if we were relying solely on alpine skiers, we would be in hot water. Um, <clears throat> we have fa actually fallen from 9.3 million skiers to 7 million skiers over 15 years. So where are the other visits coming from? Let's add snowboarders into the mix. Snowboarders have more than doubled, 2.8 million in 1995 to over 6.2 million today, which means that overall our growth is about 9.1%. To all you snowboarders out there, thank you for saving us. We appreciate it. You guys in the back especially. 
Now, 9% growth again over 15 years. These are the number of individuals who come skiing and riding. Isn't exactly record growth either. So let's take a look at how many visits per person that we see in the U.S. Ironically, 1995 was 4.3 million, uh, 4.3 visits per person. 2009, 4.3 visits per person. That would look flat. Uh, if 2010 and 2011 go according to what we think it will, they should go up. But the trend is pretty obvious. We are seeing more visits per person. Our high about four years ago was five visits per person. 2009 was a bad year because of the global economy. <clears throat> so we've taken that into account and we see the natural cycle. But overall, what this means is what we have been doing is feeding short-term growth because we've gotten the core of skiers and riders to continue to come back. They come back more often. We have more people that are returning that used to be ski and skiers and riders, but we haven't seen much evidence that there are a lot of new beginners coming in. So the National Ski Areas Association, PSIA Aussie, the U.S. industry in general has renewed its focus on bringing beginners into snow sports and bringing more of them back each and every day. Just a note about the population, <clears throat> because the population obviously is important in this equation. About 59% of our population is over the age of 30. So 41% is under the age of 30. And we've relied mostly on the older population <clears throat> as snow sports participants. This chart, if we look over on the far right-hand side, the 66-year-old and up, those are 2% of the participants in snow sports. And for obvious reasons, they're leaving us every single day. The group that we have relied on traditionally in the U.S., in some parts of the world, are known as baby boomers. These are 46 to 65-year-olds. That's 20% of participants, and they too are leaving every day. There are not enough modern painkillers in the world to keep them coming back more often, which means we have to rely more and more on the younger. The good news is we attract far more 30 to 45-year-olds than one might hope, uh, but there's not enough of them in comparison to the overall population to make up for those that are leaving. And then the 11 to 29 year olds. The good news is we're getting them in as well, but what is concerning to us, and I think speaks to yesterday's conversation and the one we just saw, we don't have enough under 11. That's 2% of our participant base coming in as skiers and riders. And there are some reasons for this. One is the traditional marketplace, the northern parts of the United States where the traditional ski and snowboard areas are, those folks are leaving those, uh, that part of the country and moving south where it's warmer. So that's one challenge that we face. Another challenge that we face is the traditional market, the traditional economics. The non-Latino whites are, are smaller and smaller proportion of our population. We have more ethnic diversity within our population. Uh, and a third point I want to make about those under 30 is there's considerable research about the influence of technology. We heard yesterday about the need for Web 2.0, but why? Why do we need Web 2.0? Because it's cool? No, we need it because people under the age of 30 typically think that the web and, and social media will help connect you more easily. It's an easier way to make friends. It's a part of the social fabric that binds people together, and that's different than most of those over 30. So any strategy for attracting and retaining individuals into snow sports has to incorporate some form of electronic communication. So we've talked about the general, general demographics, the general trends of the U.S. industry. Let's talk a little bit about motivations. And we heard a little bit about motivations in one of the keynotes talking about uh, whether it's too cold or whether the price is too high, and those may be factors. But research of the U.S. consumer reveals a little something different. 40% of those surveyed about why, they, why people do not engage in snow sports in the United States, 40% say it is because of increased family and work pressure. And it's well documented that uh, U.S. workers have finally started to overwork themselves. The pressure to work during vacation, for example, is just one of them. 40% say that's why they don't take up a pursuit like skiing and riding. The second most given reason, 23%, is they have no one to go with. They're solo. 
who wants to go alone. These are the two largest reasons why people do not go into snow sports, into skiing and snowboarding in the United States. How does that relate to why people do? We ask that question as well. <clears throat> there are three main reasons. The first is social. People want to make connections, they want to be connected, they want to be part of the culture. The culture is a big deal. So that's one thing that attracts people to snow sports. It's cool, it's exciting, it should be. The second reason, 31%, is somebody forced me to. Tagalongs. We know, you know, this young man right here may not have had much of a choice, not much vote. He came along. But we all know the story of the friend who was brought with another group of friends who felt the pressure to go and they leave that friend midway up the mountain or all the way up the mountain and they get frustrated and patrol or somebody else brings them down. They've had a bad experience. What's their story going to be? They're gone forever. So we have to focus on helping those folks make those connections and have a wonderful experience as well. But the largest group, the 46%, those are the adventure seekers. The adventure seekers are those who believe in the inherent intrinsic value of skiing and riding. They love the sense of adventure, the sense of accomplishment, and they are not, by the way, looking for somebody else to tell them how good they are. They're in it because it feels good. Now you notice, for the reasons I said why people don't engage in skiing and snowboarding and why they do, not once did I say something about how perfect your turn is. I love the perfect turn myself. However, a vacation is not guaranteed because somebody got that perfect turn. It's expected. <clears throat> in other words, when we teach people how to ski and how to ride, it's to help that experience, it's to help that connection, it's to make, make that emotional connection so you have stories to tell at the bar and at home and with your friends. And I've never heard of a vacation that was spoiled, not once by saying, you know, I didn't make that perfect left turn today. Instead, what I did is I had a great time with my friends. I made a new friend. I saw someone, I, I, I made a better connection with my family. Since we've talked a little about how this impacts lessons, let me talk about the business of lessons within the U.S. 40% of lessons in the United States are beginner lessons, which means 60% are not. And that's not, not high enough. In addition, <clears throat> most of these lessons are alpine. And if you recall our earlier slides, alpine is a decreasing portion of our, less, uh, of our business. Of the beginner lessons, the beginner lessons uh, uh, the beginner lessons before were in green. Children's lessons are 51%. Yet, of all these lessons, 69% are still alpine. Why is it important to get uh, individuals at a young age? Well, as we're talking to the area managers, those who run the ski and snowboard areas, it's easy to talk about money. <clears throat> and one is that if you get somebody into snow sports in the U.S. at the age of 25, their lifetime value, so they're 25 years old, they ski for 20 years, or they snowboard for 20 years, and <clears throat> they uh, uh, ski or ride until they are 45. They are worth, in terms of hotel, um, equipment, food service, lessons, about $18,900. If you can get them 15 years earlier, not even twice as long, they become worth $68,977. So they're worth more than three times as much to the industry if you get them at age 10 than if you get them at age 25. And with all those advances in painkillers and really great equipment, as every, many people in this audience know, it's easy to ski well past the age of 45. We've talked a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about the role of equipment. <clears throat> and I don't think it's possible to overstate how fast equipment is changing and why it's changing. We all know, you know, there are very traditional images of skiing and snowboarding. Heck, I saw some skis last night in the demo. I don't know if I could turn those anymore after all these years. But we're familiar with many of these images. What's taken place <clears throat> in the U.S. is that uh, equipment sales have declined nearly 40% in the last decade. Alpine ski sales are down 7%. Yet, in the midst of all this, we see uh, many more options for equipment. Rocker, early rise, uh, rocker and skiing and snowboarding. We're seeing more snowboard systems together for learning. Uh, many, many more choices. 
In addition, we're seeing an increase in sales in the rental shops. One of the reasons we believe is because it's much harder and much more expensive to check your skis onto an airplane. The U.S. is, after all, pretty big, and to go on vacation, that's a several hundred dollars per person to be able to take your skis. So we're seeing more and better equipment coming into the rental fleets, into, into rental shops, uh, than we are seeing sold uh, at the individual shops. What does it mean for us as instructors? Well, it means that the traditional approach has to give way to all of the images that are in front of our consumer. Because our consumer, our guest, is going to come with the equipment they want to come on, not what we tell them to come on. And anybody coming to the area has an expectation that they can ski and ride. To include, it's not just adaptive skiing, it's adaptive snowboarding. So at, on one hand, this might look like a gloomy picture. We have uh, more challenge than ever before meeting the needs of the individual guests. We have different motivations than ever before. Our growth has been flat. Uh, and we're seeing those same guests over and over. Yet, we are still seeing growth. And it's actually moved along pretty quickly the last few years. So what are the opportunities that have been out there for our association? Because one might think that if it's that flat, membership <clears throat> uh, and the interest in teaching skiing and snowboarding would be equally flat. Well, that's not true. This is our membership increase over the last 15 years. 53%. Yet, there's one, uh, one other item I haven't shared with you yet, which is what's happened with the ski and snowboard resorts, the people that operate the areas. There are 20% fewer of those than in the last 15 years, over the last 15 years. Why is that important? That's fewer places for us to work. So our association, PSI and OZI, has grown dramatically in spite of either flat visits or a declining number of ski and snowboard areas. Well, why is that? Well, a couple of reasons, and we'll, we'll get into some detail in just a moment, but one part is that in 2007, we recognized that as a, a traditionally focused Alpine Ski Association, we were on the verge of starting to either flatten out or lose membership. So we formed <coughs> under the PSI umbrella, and now the, it, we have a, a, a broader corporate entity, the American Association of Snowboard Instructors. And that kicked off one aspect of growth during this period. Then, about 2007, 2008, we made significant invest investments in technology so that our members can get information they want, when they want it, in the format that they want it, as easily as possible, not making them to come to us all the time, which is also a bit of a change. And we're still experimenting with that. But the last three years for us have been all-time high record growth. And this coming year, we are 8% ahead of our all-time record. So that would be four straight years of record growth, which we're very proud of. Why is that? Why do we think that's happened? We stay focused on our mission. Now, everyone can have a mission. Our vision is inspiring lifelong passion for the snow sports experience, for the mountain experience. Our mission is that we support our members as part of the snow sports industry to develop personally and professionally, to create positive learning opportunities, and to have more fun. And in some ways, that sounds like a lot of other missions. So how do we really bring that to life? How do we bring it home to the member? If I were to ask, our members, could they restate our mission just like that? They probably can't. They might give us some form of it. So we set to ask four questions that we could answer very simply. Why is it, are, why are we here? What, is, what do we do? That's the first question. What is it we do? Are we about certification? Are we about clinics? What is it we do? And we ask that question of our members, our staff, our volunteers to gain clarity. We ask, what is our culture? What really binds us together? What's our direction? What do we want to be? And what is our value? Why should somebody be involved with PSI and Aussie in the first place? Answering these four questions has helped us focus on <clears throat> providing value to our members and to the guest. So let me answer these questions for you. The first, what do we do, is simple. We get people excited about skiing and snowboarding, period. That's what we do. If it's an examination, if it's a clinic, if it's a guest, 
if we're talking about it, we have to get people excited. You should be excited about skiing and snowboarding. That's what we do. What's our culture? Our culture is one of connection. And that's a connection that we might not make except for being on the mountains together. We're making friends here that we would not have made if it weren't for being involved in skiing and snowboarding. And we know story after story after story of people who have met their best friend, met their spouse, uh, made lifelong friendships because of skiing and snowboarding. People you would not have met any other way. What's our direction? We want to be the hub. In other words, one place that people go to learn about how to teach better, to learn more about the mountain environment, and whether you are a consumer, a guest, or whether you are a member, there is something there for you. Now, we know we're not the only thing, but we want to be a jumping off point uh, just as we are uh, providing information about Interski. Hopefully our members are coming here and learning more about what's happening here in St. Anton this very week. And the last is, what's our value? Our value is one word, access. <clears throat> it is access to the people, places, and resources that make it easier for you to learn about skiing and snowboarding so that it gets you excited about being on the mountain. So it all comes around in one circle. What do we do? We get people excited about skiing and snowboarding. What's our culture? Our culture is of connection. What is our direction? We want to be the one place you go to learn about skiing and snowboarding and more about the mountains. And what is our value? It's access to that information, access to those people, so that you can keep people fired up and excited about skiing and riding. There's one more element of change I wanted to share with you <clears throat> that really drives home the point of how PSI and Aussie have changed over the years. And that has to do with the credentials that we have developed uh, and offered up over the last 15 years. In 1996, 90% of the certifications that we issued were Alpine. Very only uh, less than 5% snowboard, 3.5% uh, or less in uh, Nordic or adaptive. <clears throat> How has that changed? Look at this over time. Now, just a little more than two-thirds are alpine. Uh, we've seen snowboarding increase fourfold in terms of the certifications that we offer. Uh, we've more than doubled in Nordic and adaptive, which means our members' wants, needs, and interests are also demonstrably more diverse. So we have to make sure that we meet the needs of those groups just as we need to meet the needs of our guests. How is this different than it is in other parts of the world? Well, in, in many parts of the world, you certify first so that you have a license to teach. <clears throat> That's not the way it works in the US. We actually, the ski and snowboard area hires, and what we do is we try to provide education and experience to prepare them for that first exam at that basic level, and then move on, uh, on to more advanced topics. What does that do for us? It helps us get more individuals hooked into and excited about teaching skiing and snowboarding as much as doing the activity itself. Because we live or die based on whether or not our members want to sign a dues check and be involved with our association, <clears throat> which as you can see over the last few years has worked pretty well. So how does this tie into the bigger picture of resort management? How does that enthusiasm, what we've learned in PSI Aussie, work? Well, it's safe to say that historically uh, those that run the ski and snowboard areas have not been as in tune with the needs of the ski and snowboard school. Uh, they're more comfortable with lifts, more comfortable with food service, more comfortable with selling tickets, more comfortable with lodging. But those same people in our environment also own the ski and snowboard schools. Yet those managers for lifts, food service, tickets were all over here and the director might be over here. That's starting to change, <clears throat> and we have a renewed enthusiasm for that change this last year because the focus on beginners and the need to get more business in gives us another opportunity to talk about why lessons are important. And it's pretty basic. The more you have happy, satisfied guests, the more profitable you're going to be, the more revenue you're going to generate, and we have study after study that shows that's true, that having money and having happy guests will work together. <clears throat> they don't have to work against each other. 
We know that lesson takers spend more at the area than non-lesson takers. We know that lesson takers are more likely to come back than non-lesson takers. So it's a fairly straightforward equation. More happy, satisfied guests are going to result in more profitability. And we know that guests who take lessons tend to be more satisfied and are more likely to recommend skiing and snowboarding than those who don't. The second area <coughs> relates to this in terms of a focus on customer satisfaction and employee loyalty and service. <clears throat> What's implied here in the best areas in the US place a focus on creating relationships between that instructor and the guest. And again, one of the things that our teams will talk about tomorrow is how our learning partnership helps create that connection and also how on snow we reinforce that connection. In order to do that well, the area has to place an incentive on having employees who are motivated and loyal and understand what is happening in your, at, at your ski area or our ski area. <clears throat> One of the other things that relates to that employee loyalty and service is it's much easier to keep that loyal customer once you've got them than it is to constantly try and develop new ones. And that may seem at odds. You want to develop more beginners all the time, but you also want to have an experienced staff who knows what to do with that guest when they, when they uh, get into the system. The third, and probably the biggest area, is inclusion. Now, I talked earlier about some of the uh, demographic changes. So for the first time, we are seeing five generations of students show up, sometimes in the same class. Mom, dad, grandmother, grandfather, the kids all want to go out. 15, 20 years ago in our system, there was no such thing as the family private lesson. Those are commonplace now. Uh, just last week, I was at a ski school in Colorado where a uh, snowboard instructor was taking out eight children and four of them were on snowboards and the other four were on skis. So that instructor has to figure out what to do regardless of the tool that's in front of them. Plus, uh, as, as we look at uh, the disabled within uh, the U.S. community, they are being asked in some cases to be mainstreamed into a class and not being put in a separate adaptive class. So an, a, an area has to have a strategy to meet the needs of that individual guest, whoever shows up, because if you turn somebody away, especially in the disabled community, you're not turning one person away, you're turning away an entire family. So that's that one person times five. Now all of a sudden the numbers also get bigger and it's the right thing to do. So to sum up, <clears throat> to summarize, all of these changes challenge our traditional approaches to skiing, to teaching skiing and snowboarding. It's important that we understand the needs of each individual guest and not treat them just as a group. We have to make that individual connection in a group lesson as well as in a private lesson. We need to complement with technology. What I'm showing you here are not only some things we've done, but this is an example of what Vail Associates launched this year called Epic Mix. And it's a social media tool that allows your friends to keep track of each other. What they did on the hill that day connects to Facebook and other social media tools. And now instead of bragging at the bar, they're also bragging online to each other. And this is what I mean about creating a social connection that goes beyond what we traditionally know. Last, deliver. I like to be this guy. Deliver the excitement, deliver the enthusiasm, deliver the promise of flying that is skiing and snowboarding. That's what we are here to do. So, as you leave here today, I hope you found some nugget or some inspiration, some idea that inspires you. And on our website, in just a moment, if you go to the snowpros.org, you'll see a link that says Interski 2011. <clears throat> on that link, if you go to that, you will see the notes from this presentation as well as the research from the National Ski Areas Association and others that helped uh, help uh, support this speech, as well as access to some of our new electronic tools, uh, one called the Movement Matrix and electronic copies of our magazine so that you don't have to fly them all home with you and pay an extra $100 or 50 euro a bag. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you being here. We hope to see you tomorrow at our team's lecture as well as the on-snow workshops and see how this all comes to life on snow. Thank you. <laughs>